Hello. So, uh, good morning, and sort of thank you for for joining us uh, for an event I've really been uh, looking forward to on the future of Nur Sultan Nazarbayev's uh, Kazakhstan. I think there are there are moments in which I there are moments in which uh, a panel a panel discussion feels uh, actually acutely relevant, even in Washington D.C. And this was one of the moments when this dramatic, or perhaps not so dramatic, news of Nazarbayev's shifting uh, political manoeuvres uh, hit, I felt that it was uh, really essential to gather some of the most esteemed uh, experts in Central Asia to come and discuss it uh, with us uh, here at the uh, Hudson Institute. You know, the sort of dramatic story of Kazakhstan since... Uh, the fall of the Soviet Union and even sort of preceding it, I think, is one of the most uh, interesting stories in uh, in the former Soviet uh, uh, space and uh, a topic which I think we need to pay more attention to uh, in Washington and a topic that I'm excited to bring to the Hudson Institute uh, this morning. So sort of please join me in welcoming uh, three of the most esteemed uh, experts in this topic. So I'm joined by Marlene Laruel, the Associate Director and Research Professor at the Institute for European, Russian and Eurasian Studies at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University. So thank you for, for, for joining us. Um, joined by Erica Marat, the Associate Professor at the College of Inter International and Security Affairs at the National Defense University. And last but not least, by Nate Schenken, the Director for Special Research at Freedom House. So in terms of like how we're going to uh, structure this event, each of my panelists is going to speak for minimum six, <laughs> maximum nine minutes on their responses to Kazakhstan at this uh, turning point. Then, as a moderator, I will sort of be asking them uh, questions for about half an hour, and then we'll open it up to the floor. So, thank you. So, Malin, maybe you'd like to, yes. to, to begin. To begin with, well, thank you so much for the invitation. I would begin kind of launching our discussion with four main points. The first one is that what we are seeing in Kazakhstan, it's a resignation from the presidency by Nazarbayev, but it's not really a leave, right? A resignation, but not a leave. I think we should credit him for being able to leave power voluntarily, not under pressure from the street after 30 years of power. That's something that he will be remembered for. At the same time, we have to be realistic on the way he's keeping a lot of political power, a lot of symbolic power, and a lot of immunity-related uh, 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 power. I think the parallel, of course, with Uzbekistan is interesting to follow, and many people have been discussing how much maybe Karimov this in power has been a kind of trigger for Nazarbayev to take the decision. What I found really interesting say, is that we had two cases of countries with almost 30 years leader. One has been dying in power, but the successor has been able to reform the country in a quite impressive way. So you can have a kind of reform from the inside of elites who have been in power for a very long time. And then we have the Kazakhstani case of a president being able to leave. So that just the kind of, I think, really interesting element of discussion for those of us who are interested by kind of political science and, and transformation of authoritarian uh, uh, regime. What I think we will see uh, uh, happening in, a, in, a, in Kazakhstan is in fact a kind of three-step transition, three-step denazerbaification of political life. The first step is the one we are now. Is no more president. There is an interim president. There will be election. So it's the first transitional phase. The second phase will be someone will be elected president and will have to share power with Nazarbayev. So there will be a kind of duo of power, a president, and Nazarbayev keeping a lot of uh, uh, important uh, uh, tools of power. And then there will be a third transition. The day Nazarbayev will not be there anymore, and then there will be a president who will be suddenly alone <laughs> in managing with no more Nazarbayev around. So we, you see the kind of three steps, they can uh, uh, take several years. I think what the phases we are now in, in a sense, 
maybe the most risky because we don't see exactly which games will be played. I think that if the strategy would be to push Dariga Nazarbayeva to the presidency, that will be a very risky move because she doesn't have support from the, the population and that would create a kind of domino effect on the political elites, the technocrats, the oligarchs in reaction to the Nazarbayev family. For sure, she will stay in any kind of, in some capacities around circles of power because she's a guarantee uh, uh, for the whole family. But I think pushing her to the presidency would be a risky move, but maybe it will not be done. Second uh, uh, point I wanted to make is that since Nazarbayev has been living, we have seen a lot of parallels made with Singapore as an example of something that uh, Kazakhstan has been looking at and paralleling uh, um, Nazarbayev with uh, Lee Kuan Yew. It's an interesting comparison because you have this kind of family capitalism model. I would be also careful in using the parallel. I think Singapore has been much more successful in fighting against corruption than Kazakhstan has been able to do. Uh, Singapore really put a lot of its energy in education and kind of work ethics and given the level of corruption in Kazakhstan, unfortunately, I think this strategy has been largely undermined. Another key element is that Singapore, Singapore is without uh, oil and gas resources, so in a sense it's easier to reinvent yourself as a country. It will be much more difficult for Kazakhstan because resources can play as a a curse. When you have them, it's difficult to try to move away from them. And then, of course, it's not the same geopolitical environment. It's probably much more difficult for, for Kazakhstan than it was for, for Singapore. Third point, if we try to look forward, what do we see? So we see what we have been calling this Nazarbayev generation slowly arriving uh, in power. If you look sociologically, this Nazarbayev generation, it's not, so people who were born under Nazarbayev, Nazarbayev presidency, it's 9 million people, it's 51% of the population. So it's already huge. Some of them, the oldest among this uh, generation, those who are in their late 30s, are slowly becoming in power. And since 2014, we have seen a real strategy developed by the state institution to bring to several positions of power, new generation of people, as I said, in their 30s, in their early 40s, as Akin, so as regional governor at the mayorship of Almaty and Astana in the new OTAN presidential party, and also the whole state control media world has been entirely reshaped since 2014 with young figures. So you can see that sociologically, the preparation of the post Nazarbayev era was already in process during the last year, that is, this last uh, four years. When we try to identify who are these young people arriving slowly in power, we see, and of course that will probably evolve. First, we see they could be in conflict with older generation. So you could have a generational conflict. You could also have some tensions inside this younger generation. We all know about the Bolashak, those who have been trained uh, abroad, mostly in the West, who really constitute a kind of union inside the system, a state inside the the state, we ha which have, we don't know exactly, but probably more kind of a pro-Western, maybe not pro-democratic or pro-liberal, but pro-Western orientation. And then we have what we call the Q generation, Q for the first list of Kazakhstan, the day it will be moving to Latin alphabet. <laughs> this Q generation, so it's a very symbolic uh, uh, name, is, uh, let's say, more nationalist, looking more toward Asia than many of the Bolashak people. So you could imagine that these two groups will progressively constitute two different political cultures that will have to kind of negotiate what they want for the future uh, uh, of Kazakhstan. So I think we have been seeing since a few years this kind of change of political atmosphere inside uh, this younger generation, but if we try to see how it could kind of impact, for example, foreign policy, and that will be my last uh, uh, point, I think we should be very careful. I would be very surprised to, need to see any change in foreign policy. You can have new generation arriving in power being more anti-Russian and more anti-Chinese, especially with what is going on now with the, the, the mass internment, internment of camp of uh, Uyghurs and Kazakhs. But that doesn't give a lot of room of maneuver for Kazakhstan to try to challenge the relationship to Russia, the partnership with Russia, uh, both militarily and economically, and the relationship to, 
to China. So I don't think that whoever is in power will have a large room of maneuver, will not have a large of maneuver, large room of maneuver. And in terms of a, a more domestic issue, the social expectations are very high. People are frustrated because they don't see standard of living improving as they would like to see them. They were promised much more in terms of uh, progress of standard of living and prosperity than what they are having now. So you have different forms of frustration. You clearly have social frustration among rural people, regions, the very high regional inequality. But you also have frustration am among the more urban, highly educated youth, which is also kind of unhappy with the, with, with the situation and which could be probably maybe more activated in this kind of transition period. And if I see one of, I think, is the big element that people would like to see uh, uh, changing, it's not about democracy, it's not about political pluralism. At the best, it's about fighting against corruption, but what I think is the main issue is the, 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 maintain, the maintaining of the welfare state, right? People want to have public services functional, they want to have pensions, they want to have health care, they want to have access to education. And that's really the key element where the new regime will be kind of tested on uh, its ability to deliver to this expectation. And I think I will stop here. It was a kind of broad overview. Cool. Thank you. No, that's, uh, thank you for a, for a brilliant uh, opening presentation. I've got a lot of questions <laughs> that I, I want to ask you. Uh, Erica. Yes. Um, so I'd like to pick up on what Marlene just mentioned, that uh, during transition period, there will be an activation of some of the grievances in the population um, that might end up um, in spontaneous protests or mobilization. Um, and we've all seen that shortly after uh, there was a decision made to rename Astana to Nur Sultan, there was spontaneous protest. And what those, the response of the state and interior ministry specifically to those protests showed me, show, you know, showed three specific features that have been developed under Nazarbayev, but that will perhaps need to be transformed um, going forward. So the first uh, feature of responding to those protests was, um, and all those features were developed in the aftermath of the Zhen uh, massacre in December 2011. So the first was, and everyone noticed that there were targeted arrests of activists and journalists. And we've seen this happen in protests before in 2016 um, against uh, land reform uh, issue that act dozens of activists were arrested, sometimes even before they could reach the site of uh, mobilization. Once they walk out of their homes, they would be thrown into uh, police cars. So that's one, targeted arrest of the activist base during demonstrations. The second one is something that we shouldn't take for granted co compared to other uh, similarly authoritarian states is Kazakhstan police, um, their utter reluctance to use violence against protesters. So we didn't see any beatings, we didn't see any um, uh, gas or water cannons, so anything that would show the power of the state to the protesters. And that's in contrast, for instance, to Yanukovych regimes, to Putin regime when we see um, mass mobilization in neighboring countries. And why is that? It's because I think because Nazarbayev um, enjoys um, somewhat greater popularity compared to other autocrats in the former Soviet space, um, there is a sensitivity to the idea that once you use violence against protests that you uh, escalate tensions and you bring broader coalitions of activists now resisting not just the narrow policy issue but resisting just the oppressive nature of the state. So there was this avoidance of use of violence. And, this, and the third feature of responding to those protests, and we again see this uh, policy tool developed in the aftermath of Jan Ozean, is that instead of addressing the grievances of the protesting public and trying to open up the dialogue, try to justify further the idea of renaming the capital city and how it fits in this whole picture of transition, um, the government moved ahead and tried to continue to win the hearts and minds of the majority population. So um, Tokayev presented himself, uh, tried to normalize his idea of being this new leader, uh, pretend like nothing is, you know, everything is in place and there is no real crisis. So there was a lot of this performative aspect of the state as well. So winning the hearts and minds of the population. 
And what does it say about the internal security apparatus in Kazakhstan in general? Well, it, it, it shows how the interior ministry in Kazakhstan is like um, in other countries in the former Soviet space, is a Soviet construct that will, that will support the status quo, the political status quo. And um, going forward, it doesn't matter if the next leader will not be as popular as Nazarbayev or even not as, legitimately, as legitimate as perceived by the population as Nazarbayev. The, transi the transition of loyalty to the next leader uh, from the interior ministry will be seamless and will be wholesome. Um, but the problem here is, unlike Nazarbayev's regime, when, um, again, Nazarbayev was able to um, single-handedly suggest um, policy decisions um, in response to protests, um, you know, reshuffle his government and kind of present this idea of political stability. Um, the new leader might not enjoy this, um, um, th th this kind of powers. So if the, if the next leader is not, and it's most likely going to be the case, whether it's Dariga, Nazarbayeva, or any other uh, political official that we know in Kazakhstan, that the next leader will not enjoy as broad of a support in Kazakhstan as Nazarbayev, not as much charisma, uh, whatever other magic Nazarbayev had during his presidency. And the activist base is likely to broaden as well. And it will be a lot more difficult for the interior ministry to continue on those targeted arrests uh, during mobilization. And there, there is a possibility, and I would watch this space, uh, this is something that I, would, um, I do um, for my research, is that there might be escalation of those cycles of violent politics um, on the streets, something that we see in other former Soviet space, um, as, as other Soviet, uh, former Soviet countries. Um, again, Yanukovych's uh, Ukraine comes to mind, um, Georgia, Kyrgyzstan. When you see a rising middle class, when you see uh, opinionated public, and other, on the other hand, unreformed security apparatus that um, blindly supports the political regime and is not open to the public. So we might see escalation of those um, contentious, um, con on those cont contentious politics. Um, the hope here is that some of the mechanisms that were established during the Azerbaijan regime of um, municipal authorities um, and those more mid-range mid bureaucrats listening to public opinion and not openly acknowledging it, but at least try to redirect their policies in order to um, deliver to the public opinion. And I'm really talking here about urban middle class. Um, that this me mechanisms will survive under the ne next leader uh, because those are the reserves of um, in good governance examples um, in, in the region when mid-level uh, politicians, bureaucrats, are able to respond to the public when the security apparatus is not able to do that. Thank you. And last but not least, uh, <laughs> Nate. Thank you. Um, and I'll try not to tread the same grounds by everyone because I think we've covered a lot of good things. I'll, I suppose I'll just start more or less in the same place as Marlene is um, whether this is a transition at all. And I think Marlene characterized it well that this is a, a small step along the path towards a transition. And I think many who follow Kazakhstan closely would say that this path has actually started several years ago with a number of constitutional changes and kind of slow rolled um, reforms that were introduced to try in some ways, if not to devolve actual powers to the parliament, to signal that there would be eventually more powers for the parliament or for the government. Um, and so this is a small step. It's a significant step. It's meaningful. Um, but to, to recap where Nazarbayev stands now as first president um, in terms of his protections and, and his powers, um, he still chairs the National Security Council. Um, he's a member of the Constitutional Council, so he gets to rule on constitutional um, judgments. Um, he has the power to introduce laws in the parliament, um, uh, unilateral power. Um, and he also has immunity, and his family also has immunity from prosecution. So these are pretty significant. Um, I think what we know now that we didn't know before a couple of weeks ago um, is, is we know that he won't die in office. 
right, as precedent. Um, that is important. It's important to avoid the Uzbek scenario, and I think perhaps um, whether this was seen this way in Kazakhstan, I think it was seen this way in Uzbekistan, the sense of panic that took place for about a week in 2016 when Karimov did fall ill and eventually died and no one quite knew what was going to happen. Um, but it doesn't actually solve the succession. So we're not actually any further in terms of knowing how the succession works or what happens. Yes, there's an election uh, in 2020. We don't actually know when it is. Um, it could be in April. It could be in December 2020. It could be before that. Um, and we also know, I would say, that the elections aren't how the president will be picked. Um, it, it's very hard to imagine that those elections are the mechanism right, for selecting the successor. So whatever happens to pick that person will still take place behind closed doors and will still take place among this quite small, not necessarily coherent, but small circle of people who consider themselves eligible and have the power to compete um, for that position. Um, so I, that, that, I think, frames kind of how I wanted to talk about then. Um, what I see is probably the biggest hole in Nazarbayev's legacy, um, which is um, the lack of institutionalization of normal politics, um, of, of any kinds of patterns of competition, debate, discussion that are allowed to take place in public um, and are allowed to have consequences for the, um, the ways in which decisions are made around the country. Um, I don't mean that Kazakhstan's government or that Nazarbayev himself has never listened to people. He obviously has. Um, and um, many of the evaluations of him that come with his resignation, I think, highlight that he's been very intelligent, a very sophisticated, um, and thoughtful and careful leader um, in these ways. But that doesn't uh, change the fact that there is no institutional basis now in which politics can really take place in Kazakhstan. And that's not for lack of other people trying. Um, this is the result of very active, often very violent, suppression of people's attempts to engage in liberal democratic politics in Kazakhstan, Kazakhs. Kazakhstanis to form political parties, to compete for power, um, and to change the direction of the country. Um, the result of that is that the big questions that Nazarbayev's successor will have, um, which any successor probably would have to any, any president who'd served this long, um, will still be in this framework in which there is not a very, um, there's not an institutionalized way of debating and forming policy. Um, it will continue to be formed by this very small group of people. And the, the questions that they face are, I don't want to say that they're, um, <clears throat> they're not unprecedented, they're not world changing, um, but they are tricky. Um, so on the economy, uh, I think um, it's important to note that Kazakhstan's boom years are behind it. Um, the first decade of the 2000s coincided with what we now know was a global commodity super cycle in which commodities worldwide, and including oil, were extremely highly valued. Oil prices were over $100 for big parts of that period. Kazakhstan boomed um, during that time. Oil prices collapsed in 2014 and 2015, and they're now in the $65 to $70 range, and I think most people expect them to stay there. Kazakhstan's growth, uh, annual growth, is projected around 3 to 4% GDP per year um, for the next several years which I know in the United States sounds nice, but when you're in a country with a high degree of inequality and, um, and a high degree of um, poverty um, is, is pretty low, um, and it puts a real ceiling on opportunity. Um, another big challenge that I think comes from that is that, um, that another big challenge that the successor is left with is, is in foreign policy. Again, not unprecedented. Any country has these kinds of challenges, but they're tricky. Um, which is especially how do you balance what's uh, happening in China, in Xinjiang, um, but also China's enormous rise, um, including in the region. Um, a lot of discomfort in Kazakhstan about that um, and about Chinese influence. And how do you balance whatever is going to happen in Russia? Um, whether that's, um, in, and, it's, and it's very hard to predict, and a lot of the difficulties in Kazakhstan in the last five years have stemmed from uncertainty and anxiety as Putin has grown more unpredictable um, since 2014 about what his intentions might be and how those relations will be balanced. I also don't see cardinal changes coming in Kazakh foreign policy. I think the elite is quite consolidated around this kind of conservative, multi-vector approach. 
Um, and I think that's very rational. Um, but it is going to continue to be very challenging. They, they don't go away. Um, and you have a problem with how to, um, how to institutionalize those debates. And then finally, the one that Marlene has raised as well, and, and that I think um, also is what Erica's discussing, is how do you, um, it, there's been a lot of work, right, to keep Kazakhstan together as a multi-ethnic society, and to, um, from a negative perspective, try to suppress national feelings or other kinds of feelings that would lead to um, competition and rivalry between groups from another perspective to try to encourage tolerance and, and coexistence. And, and both of those have coexisted. There's been the, the, the fist um, and there, there's been the glove and the fist. Um, but those, um, those are making it harder as, as those policies um, tend towards the harder end of things um, and as there, there's a failure to develop any kind of institutional mechanism for democratic discussion, um, it is very difficult to develop a different kind of economic model and a different kind of development model that would be more inclusive, that would provide more opportunities for precisely these kinds of young people who are coming up in Kazakhstan. Um, it's really hard, and, and Erica kind of hinted at this in her, when she mentioned the municipalities, it's very hard to have accountability, uh, even at the municipal level, without democratic inputs, um, without elections. Um, it's very hard to have rule of law without accountability. Um, it's hard for law enforcement to stop um, behaving with impunity and stop abusing people in the streets, either in small ways or in big ways, either political dissidents or common criminals or just people who are driving around in their cars, um, when there's no way in which they're going to be held accountable. Um, and, and so part of this you know, challenge that I think um, anyone who comes as the next successor is going to have is do we continue kind of in the same mold? And do we just kind of stay the course, not just in a foreign policy direction or stay the course maybe in our commitment to multi-ethnic Kazakhstan? I expect all of those will stay. But do we stay the course in this really um, very tightly controlled political space um, and in not tackling some of the kind of fundamental questions about abuse that do require structural solutions um, that, that can't be solved with a single anti-corruption drive or with the imprisonment of a couple of bad uh, police officers. Um, those, I, I, I won't say that I'm, I'm expecting that to happen, but I, I hope that can happen. I hope that this moment uh, can be an opportunity for that to take place. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for three brilliant uh, presentations. Uh, well, uh, I guess it's sort of, I, I'm sort of going to uh, abuse my moderator's privileges by saying that my first question is actually more of a comment. And um, I, something that I find so interesting about this, this, this story of uh, Nazarbayev is really going back to the very beginning and looking at the presence that he has in a lot of the biographies written by key Russian political actors from 1989 to 1991, like his presence in Gorbachev's memoirs discussed as a potential successor to be president of the, the Soviet Union, and through that vision, a Soviet Union that might have been of a country that if it still existed today would be at least 35 to 40% Central Asian and Muslim, and what role would that state have been in uh, international affairs? Or a recent biography I was reading, which is that of Alexander Korzhakov, a fascinating figure, the head of the bodyguards and presidential security for Boris Yeltsin in the 1990s, a turbulent figure in his own right, Korzhakov, that is, describing these meetings with Nazarbayev and how perfect his Russian was, the Russian songs that he would sing, and this man, does he really want to be president of Kazakhstan or president of Russia, and maybe he would have been a good president of Russia. And these these sort of memoirs uh, were, made me think that this is a great opportunity for us to, to ask, what does Nazarbayev say about the role of the leader in these various pathways that countries took from 1989, 1991 in the post-Soviet space? Like, to what extent, you know, how much was it up to them? Was it up to the Nazarbayevs, to the Kuchmas, to the... You know, to, to the Boris Yeltsins, how different could all of these jer political journeys been if men of different talents or prejudices had been in different positions? That's something that I've been thinking, uh, I've been thinking about uh, a lot here. And now to turn my, uh, my comment back into a question, I, 
Uh, I'd really like to, to ask the panel, really each in turn, like, how do you view Nazarbayev as a historical figure as he begins to enter his place as, uh, as a historical um, figure? And to what extent is it Nazarbayev's Kazakhstan? Or is it perhaps because of structural reasons and sociological reasons, geopolitical reasons, was a Kazakhstan of this type more or less inevitable? Or is this the Kazakhstan of one man and his personality? You know, and sort of thinking of, you know, so, so that's something I'd really like to, to sort of begin, uh, begin by, by, by asking you. So maybe, sort of, maybe Erica, would you like to? Of course. Would you like to, to, to go, would you like to go first? Okay. <laughs> sort of. No, I think that Nazarbayev's shadow or light, depending on how you look at it, uh, will continue to exist for um, the next five, ten years. I mean, he, he ingrained himself in Kazakhstan's future in documents like 2050 and 100 steps of reaching the goals of the 2050, very meticulously planned. Um, and it became the language of bureaucrats that they referred to a specific step out of this 2050 uh, policy. So he ingrained himself into the future. And some of the changes that he uh, laid out, uh, especially the change of the alphabet, I think it will take place. And um, I, I think the panel agrees with that. And I, th I also think that the next president, and perhaps um, depending on how long the next president will stay in, stay in power, and perhaps the next several leaders, they might be compared, their success or failures might be compared to that, those of Nazarbayev, because he's been uh, the foundational leader of Kazakhstan. And uh, for, for, um, for good reasons, of course, he is uh, a, a, sm a smart politician, but also um, how, the way how he was able to uh, create this trickle down effect of economic resources that it was, it didn't have, it, the Kazakhstan is not like Azerbaijan where, where you have a small group of elite, elites who enrich themselves. There has been a trickle down effect um, in, in economy in Kazakhstan compared to even, even Russia, I, I think. Um, so, yes, his um, shadow and or light will <laughs> continue to persist. So would you say that Kazakhstan? as an oligarchic structure is not, not Azerbaijan. To what extent do you think that that was the role, that was the creation of Nazarbayev, that those were policy decisions and, and that, that led to that? Or to what extent do you think that that's just the nature of the spread of resources? Perhaps my colleagues? Would well, I, I don't know if I would agree that it's not as oligarchic. I mean, I think when we haven't had perhaps as many um, breakdowns in the elite uh, in Kazakhstan, or rather we've forgotten some of them from the 2000s, um, when there was an extreme amount of fractiousness and dissent um, among the elite. Um, and there was a lot of publication. I mean, Kazakh Gate, if anyone wants to go back into the history books of the early 2000s, is one of the signal scandals that formed the perception of Central Asia in American and, and international minds as this site of great grand corruption. And that is a corruption scandal involving US oil companies, perhaps the CIA. Um, and uh, the government of Kazakhstan, including Nazarbayev himself, um, in embezzling a lot of the proceeds from the oil industry. Um, so I think there has been a formation of some kind of elite. Um, I, I think that it's very difficult when you ask about legacy to separate the myth-making um, from the actions. Yeah. There's no question that Nazarbayev himself did a number of things or was responsible for and implemented and probably led a number of things that were um, daring and brave and had enormous effect. I mean, giving up the nuclear weapons, obviously something that American policymakers will always cite about an important step that Kazakhstan took in the early 90s. Um, even things, though, in the past couple of years, this is not perhaps widely discussed, but certainly in Turkey circles it is, which is that Nazarbayev was the key interlocutor between Putin and Erdogan in the rapprochement that took place in 2016 um, over Syria. Um, after the downing of, of the Russian jet by Turkish Air Force. And, and again, this is statesmanship, essentially. And he's, he's known for it. It's not, it, I don't think that's purely myth. Um, but I think that maintaining that role then, though, actually becomes another challenge for whoever succeeds. Mm -hmm. They will have to fill these shoes. They will have to um, kind of step into that role. And I don't know that there's anyone in the wings who has that stature and perhaps has those talents as well. There's, there is a question of talent, simply. Um, 
But it, it's hard to see that as arising naturally, I think, from Kazakhstan's position. I don't think there's anything in Kazakhstan's position, to go back to your original question, that kind of dictates that it would be an effective swing state in a geopolitical sense. I think that was Nazarbayev's imagination and ability to see the field and act that created that. I'd just like to pick up something you said during your presentation, which is about this lack of institutionalization and uh, how, in a, po in a, in a post Nazarbayev era, not, not a sort of a late Nazar, a twilight Na Nazarbayev era, how chaotic do you think that, how much potential for chaotic politics is there at an elite level or a social level in Kazakhstan and do you, do you think that there could, Kazakh politics could start to resemble the politics of other Central Asian states or uh, other Eurasian states sort of more? I'm just interested in your how much. I, I, I expect it will stay largely the same just because I think the elites are capable of kind of hashing out their differences amongst themselves largely. I mean, but it is speculation. I mean, I, I, and I, I think many different factors can play into that that we simply don't know right now. Um, I, you know, there's there's always been a debate in Central Asia about succession, and I think it's tended sometimes towards the hysterical um, in terms of what might come when, say, Karimov dies. Um, and in fact, when Karimov died, there was a feeling for a few days that no one knew quite what was going to happen, and then everybody sorted it out. <laughs> um, and I think similarly with Nazarbayev, I think in, in Kazakhstan's case, the conversation is much more advanced internally, obviously, than it is externally. And so I expect that there is kind of a real discussion that's taking place and has been taking place and that they will arrive at some kinds of agreements that will have enough protections for enough actors that everybody will feel like they can continue. Um, in terms of social stresses, I mean, I, I would defer to, I think, Erica and Marlene. I don't think the social stresses are new. They're all well known. They're all well identified. Everyone understands them. It's just how do you manage them? Um, and they have models for doing that. Um, and, and I don't know how much those really depend on Nazarbayev's charisma versus, say, the apparatus mm -hmm. itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if I can add no, some, please, please, some, some elements on, on that. I, I really agree. I think that, I mean, all really important state leaders are aware of their own legacy and are working on it. And I think we can see historically how Nazarbayev always imagined what he wanted to live and how he would be remembered in history in textbook uh, globally. So I think he really devoted quite a good amount of work in building that uh, uh, legacy. And I agree that I think what happens domestically, the way Kazakhstan looks domestically, I'm not sure it's a Nazarbayev product. Uh, there was not a lot of room of maneuver. So I think it's more kind of structural element that made Kazakhstan what it is now domestically. I think where he had a real impact in terms of personalities is the way he built the image of Kazakhstan mm -hmm. on the international scene. I mean, the denuclearization is really, and we know he really consider it as his kind of personal uh, uh, legacy. Fighting for regional integration, either at the Eurasian level or at the Central Asian level, is also something he has been pushing for a lot. Signing border delimitation treaty with all the neighbors was also kind of securing symbolically the borders of Kazakhstan was something where I think he really put a lot of energy. And as we, as we said, just kind of so socializing on the international scene, Kazakhstan as a key actor able to play a role of platform. I think that's really his own construction. You could imagine a Kazakhstan without that and still being more or less the same domestically. On the kind of Azerbaijan Kazakhstan comparison, that I thought really interesting. I would agree, in fact, with, with uh, uh, Erika. I think Azerbaijan has been really less redistributive than what Kazakhstan has been able to, able to build. If you look at the way wealth from oil and gas has been able to kind of spread across the society, I think Kazakhstan did a better job than Azerbaijan, which doesn't mean that he did a perfect job far, far from there. Of course, you have different situations that in Azerbaijan, the regime can afford to be uh, uh, more repressive and less redistributive because you have a sovereignty threat, right, which, which Kazakhstan uh, uh, doesn't have. And I think, yeah, one of the big challenges for the successor will be to manage domestic legitimacy, but also to manage big political change that can happen suddenly, right? Because for that, you need to be mm -hmm. skilled, mm -hmm. right? Depending on what will happen in Russia, in a few years, you could imagine that something important is happening in Russia, and then you need to have a leader 
that have the capacity, the legitimacy, and just the personal skills yes. to kind of navigate <laughs> trouble waters. So we will see. Well, I was really fascinated during your presentation about the way you talked of a generation Q mm -hmm. of more sort of um, Kazakh sort of nationalist tendencies emerging, and then these more pro-Western, if not pro-democratic camp uh, emerging, and this possibility mm -hmm. that you could have a more anti-Russian and anti-Chinese political culture development. I'd love it if you could sketch that out more, and w any particular figures do you associate with either sort of camp, any, wh where can we see that playing out in, in Kazakhstan? So the, the anti-Chinese mood of several public figures in Kazakhstan has been a whole st old story, right? There was always some group of the population and some public figures who were anti-Chinese, and that was partly authorized in the, in the narrative sometimes, I mean, not too much, but there was room for being anti-Chinese, and now we see with what is happening in Tinkyang that this mood get kind of is growing and could put the, the, the authorities into some troubles on the way they manage their relationship to China. The anti-Russian mood is something more recent. It was always there, but much more limited and with not a lot of legitimacy before. Now we have seen it rising because you have younger generation able to use social media, for example, to promote this this more anti-Russian mood, I think the 2014 event also play a, a key role in kind of giving them a, a more legitimacy. So, so this anti-Russian mood is also part of this general trend that you see all over the region about thinking of Russia in a kind of post-colonial term, right? So it's not so much speaking about being a post-Soviet state, it's speaking ab about we have been a post in a post-colonial situation and Russia is identified as the, the, the colonial power. This is a rising uh, a narrative, but as I said, I don't think it can really impact a lot in, in terms of foreign policy. It can impact the domestic atmosphere. Mm. But what I think is really important to realize is not so much that you have this kind of rising generation with a more kind of consolidated anti Russian narrative, that the Russian minority is getting weaker and weaker just demographically. So in a sense, the relationship to the Russian minority is slowly getting out of the picture geopolitically, right? A lot of Russians from Kazakhstan are immigrating to Russia, and that has been revived. The level of immigration are quite high. A lot of tens of thousands of Russia, ethnic Russian from Kazakhstan are studying in Russia, and usually they don't come back because they find a job in Russia. So this Russian minority is shrinking. So in the forthcoming decade, what will be really an issue domestically in terms of national identity will be to decide what it means to be Kazakhs, yeah. not so much what it means to be Kazakh in relation to Russia. It will be what it means to be Kazakh, the place of Islam, the place of the national language, and then this kind of orientation between who would be more pro-Western or pro-Asian in very broad sense. That's fascinating. Um, well, just uh, Sort of, if I may make a sort of a, a small comment there, is that if you look at these various surveys of um, Kazakh demography in the late 20th century, there are various surveys where the Kazakh, uh, probably the ethnic Kazakhs, became a minority. And if you imagine the political situation then, I think it's an amazing, it's one of those moments in history in which the unthinkable happened. It was would not have been conceivable when those surveys were done in the 70s or in the 70s or the 80s, that we would be talking about a, in, so, uh, in 2019 in these terms of an independent Kazakhstan with the demography in such a different uh, direction, I think. But I wanted to, I wanted to, to ask uh, uh, you, uh, you, you Nate, this, I'm very interested in that mm -hmm. point about like a post-colonial situation and that we, I think that what we see in Kazakhstan is very much like a culture, it's been a cultural project of how can you de-Russify this, uh, this state. I'm, I'm interested, Nate, how, how do you compare that to other de-Russification projects, mm -hmm. you know, from Tallinn to, mm -hmm. to, to Tbilisi? Yeah. How successful has this one been? Uh, how clo what's, what kind of destination do you think we, we will end up in? And, Look, this sort of question, 
that we haven't really sort of come onto yet of a diminishing American role in Central Asia and perhaps a diminishing American soft power present. How does that feed into to, to this, yeah. these projects yeah. and these visions? Well, the first thing I would say is I, I'd be hesitant to call it a de-Russification project because I think um, Nazarbayev and the government of Kazakhstan has always been very careful, explicitly careful, to prevent it from becoming de-Russification and to, even with things like the Latin alphabet announcement, um, and multiple announcements, but the, the, the version that we're on now, that, um, that it's not directed towards Russia, that it doesn't change the relationship. And it's always partnered as well with quite significant investment, not only on the state-to-state um, -state level, on the bilateral level, but in literal integration, I mean, in the Eurasian Economic Union with the Russian economy. So I think if you're looking at it from the perspective of Russia and you're asking, you know, is Kazakhstan moving away from us or moving closer, Kazakhstan has always wanted to give both answers um, yes. and has given both. Um, and perhaps on the cultural level has given um, a bit of, we would like to keep a little bit of distance and a little bit of separation, um, especially since 2014. Um, but much of that distance and separation, I think, is intended for domestic audiences. And we, Marlene sort of hinted at it, but you know, after Crimea, after the, Ukraine, the war in Ukraine started, and after the, uh, Russia seized Crimea, there was this incident in August 2014 at Seliger at the youth camp. Um, where Putin speaks every year, yeah. mm. where Putin answered a question from the audience, uh, supposedly spontaneous from a young woman, and said, you know, Kazakhs, and, and who asked, this woman asked, could there be a Ukrainian scenario in Kazakhstan? I'm worried about our compatriots there. And uh, Putin said, um, you know, Nazarbayev is the greatest leader in the former Soviet Union, the smartest man uh, here. I, I trust him enormously. Um, you know, it's hard what he's done because Kazakhs have never had statehood. They didn't have statehood until Nazarbayev. Um, it was this very profound insult, almost a threat. Yes. Um, uh, and echoes various statements that Putin had made about yeah. Ukraine, like right. well, it's word right. for word. And it was taken that way. And so some of what we've seen since then is the effort to build up a very conscious statehood narrative in Kazakhstan that responds to that, um, explicitly responds to what Putin said and also sends a message to domestic audiences that we are looking after your cultural needs, you know, that we are addressing your cultural needs. We're not going to allow you to be subsumed in Russian culture. But it's always paired with this other aspect of Russia is our closest partner, our closest ally, our closest economic partner. And so I, you know, it's, it's boring to say that it will kind of continue, but I do think it will continue. I, I, I have trouble imagining an elite that comes in with the limited room to maneuver that they're given, really making a cardinal change on those two paths and either reversing this um, very cautious policy on cultural terms or, um, or reversing um, a, a relatively advanced policy on economic and other kinds of integration with Russia. That integration is never going to reach the point of you know, actual full-blown integration um, because of the, the sense of fear that people have in the public and in the elite about Russia kind of occupying Kazakhstan, but it's also never going to be put into reverse gear and taken back. Uh, a point that sort of come out of this panel, which I think is, is really interesting, is, um, well, firstly, that's forgotten that there are also Kazakhs which are being targeted by China's policies in, uh, in Xinjiang. And what does that mean for Kazakhstan's place in Belt and Road going forward? Uh, what, what are, what's going to be the consequences of this uh, increasingly shocking Chinese policy in Xinjiang on the room for maneuver that future leaders in the city formerly known as uh, Astana, uh, what, what, do you, what does, is that going to mean for the, the dynamic with China? And what will that mean for the relationship with Russia, I, I guess, accordingly? Maybe we'd like to... Okay, Answer. sure. Um, yeah, so. But I think Marlene and Nate can also pitch in here. So I think there is um, there is frustration in the society about how Nazarbayev has never really openly confronted Chinese leadership about uh, Kazakhs being repressed in those camps as well. And more so, there has been um, arrests of some of the activists related to um, you know, related to um, activism around uh, advocacy, activism around bringing this issue, um, to, uh, discussing this issue in Kazakhstan. Um, I think um, was the the more there was going to be political uncertainty um, and this 
And, I mean, who knows what's going to happen even before elections uh, with the power sharing or after, or, or when a new president is elected and Nazarbayev is still alive. Um, there might still be an ongoing political uncertainty about where does the power lie? Who holds the power? And when there is such political uncertainty, it gives this political space for activists' voices. And um, that's when we can see, we may see uh, more voices, uh, you know, more crit criticism of the government about um, being silent uh, about what's happening in China. It will provide, it will provide opportunity for those grievances to be, to be voiced. And that will be a challenge, I think, for uh, political leadership in Kazakhstan. Um, it, of course, will also translate into anti-Chinese uh, moves in general. But um, a smart way for Kazakhstan leadership to deal with that would be separating economic collaboration with uh, China and also um, showing that they care for this idea of Kazakhness, or at least for um, how some of the residents of Kazakhstan who traveled to China, or relatives of the residents, so repatriated ethnic Kazakhs to China, how their family members, so if they don't appeal to the ethnic component, at least to the citizenship, idea of citizenship and how citizens' rights are being violated in China, China, China and um, labor camps in China, this could be a very, a very healthy way of addressing, addressing this issue for Kazakhstan yeah. leadership. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear your, yeah, yeah. your thoughts uh, so, as well. So many, but I totally agree. I think it has been already like more than a decade that Kazakhstan has to manage this kind of sinophilia for business and sinophobia in the society. Yes. And you could imagine having both at the same time. Look at many Southeastern Asian countries that are very close to China. They live under this kind of Chinese economic domination and fear of China. And you can do both at the same time, right? We are not rational yes. states, are not rational actors, and we are neither. So you could imagine having the two at the same time. But that's clearly becoming a, an issue both for the Kazakhstani authorities and for the Chinese authorities to know what to do to fight against this sinophobia. And I think they don't have any solution. I mean, Chinese soft power is very limited. And learning Chinese is not, in fact, enough to change uh, 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 sinophobia. So they will have, on one way or another, to be able to manage uh, uh, that element. I think what Erika said about trying to dissociate, because trying to protect Uyghurs from what is happening to them is very difficult. I mean, we are failing at doing it. I don't think Kazakhstan can do better. But dissociating what is happening to Kazakhs to what is happening to Uyghurs could be a, a kind of soft way to try to navigate in showing more mm -hmm. kind of Kazakhstani authorities' will to protect uh, uh, Kazakhs in China and letting the international community managing the the Uyghur issue. What I think could be emerging in Kazakhstan is that who will be the voices who will be bringing that narrative about Kazakhstan need to do something for the region. If it's not secular voices, then it will be Muslim voices who will shape that narrative and who will create some legitimacy on saying like, well, China is really damaging Muslims globally on its own territory, and we have to take care of that. So there will be not only an ethnic aspect, but there could be a kind of Muslim solidarity aspect emerging. Not so far, but it's possible. Yeah. Uh, I would just, I would just yeah. quickly flip it, if I may, to say that I think that's really China's, it's, it's, it's a problem that China has for the Belt and Road. And it, it, it's really what's happening in Xinjiang has become a true crisis for its whole idea of what the Belt and Road was about in Central Asia which was that you would develop this region um, in Xinjiang, but also in, in its neighboring regions. And that, through the development, the economic growth, this like classic modernization theory, that would diminish the grievances and make it so that separatism and terrorism would not arise. You know, For various reasons internal to China, they've gone in a very different direction in the past couple of years, and we're seeing the fruits of that. But it, it undermines the whole concept. Um, now, whether that concept matters in the long term for you know China or for what it's actually doing, whether the Belt and Road is a real project or just a label that's slapped on a bunch of stuff, you know, is much debated. But it, it certainly means that the the main concept of it, the thrust of it, really has broken down completely. And I don't know that they'll be able to rebuild. They certainly won't be able to rebuild it so long as the camps are are, are running the way they are, and so long as especially Kazakhs and Kyrgyz 
and other Central Asian Muslim minorities are, are in them. Um, but even long term, this may really be a, a death blow to the kind of the whole idea that this would be a peaceful rise and that no one would get hurt and that all of this, everybody would benefit equally from the, the rise of this you know, superpower in Asia. Um, it's, it's unfortunately giving the lie to that, and I, these are the people who are suffering. No, it's a, it's a, I'm really, really fascinated by this turning point that we could, we're beginning to see in Kazakhstan and also elsewhere in the, the Belt and Road uh, region. And just in Pakistan a few days ago, there was an instance where Imran Khan was actually challenged by a journalist um, to, to speak up for the, the Muslims of, uh, of Xinjiang. Sort of, Imran Khan said he didn't know about the, the issue, but I think it's very interesting that it's reached this point where... Uh, a leader is being directly challenged in the public domain uh, about this. Um, uh, I've got another question for, for you, Nate, where I'm sort of interested that we haven't felt it necessary to even discuss it up until this point, which is the role of the United States in the, in the, in the region. Sort of, um, you know, if we've been having this, uh, this panel sort of... Um, uh, in the at the beginning of the decades or uh, 15 years ago, it was very much a conversation about the trilateralization of influence in the region, American power, the American-Kazakh relationship, and what does... <laughs> well, it's... I'd love to hear your thoughts. It's gotten a lot quieter. I mean, look, the, I think... Has it ceased to exist? Oh, well, no, no. We, I mean, it certainly we, uh, still exists. What can we expect? <laughs> You know, uh, it, it's just on a much lower level of priority, um, I would say, for, for what this administration or any administration is likely to do. Um, the biggest change is, is really Afghanistan. I mean, um, Afghanistan defined Central Asia policy for the first decade of the century um, and a little bit beyond. Um, as Afghanistan um, has bogged down into whatever we want to call it, a quagmire for the United States, it... Um, has become something that there's a lot less ambition and a lot less excitement attached to it and attached to doing something about it um, in the United States. There's more just a frustration in a sense that we're not going anywhere. Central Asia's role in this was always secondary, of course. It was the transit zone, right, for how you supplied U.S. forces in Afghanistan when Pakistan was closed. So the reason it escalated in such dramatic importance was when Pakistan closed the transit corridor um, and, and you had to build what was called the Northern Distribution Network to allow um, U.S. military supplies and material and troops to flow in. Um, this all really came to a close in, um, was 2014 especially, right, with the closure, it was 2014 or 2013? 14, with the closure of the Manas Transit Center in Kyrgyzstan. Yes. And once you close the transit center in Kyrgyzstan, which is essentially a base, but through which every U.S. troop entering Afghanistan was flying, um, they're really the security relationship dropped off the map. There's been little flickers in, in here and there, mostly around ISIS, um, or around people going to Syria. Um, and so there's different forms of security cooperation that still take place, and there's kind of different priorities. I think the transition in Uzbekistan has drawn interest from a development perspective and from, for the people who still, you know, professionally, and I don't want to diminish the work that the professionals in Washington do who, who work on Central Asia. I mean, Uzbekistan is a big focus in taking advantage of the opportunity there and making sure that that transition continues in a positive direction. Um, but it's not going to kind of come back in the, in the same way it was before, because there isn't a sense, I think, that the U.S. has some kind of scheme for the transformation of the region. There was this north-south notion, including Pakistan, that uh, you know, Central Asia would be integrated into a new north-south corridor um, of trade and energy and other kinds of relations, um, extending all the way down into Pakistan and India. That doesn't seem to really be going anywhere because Afghanistan remains a giant black hole below it, and also because I think Central Asian countries were many of them not that interested in that. <laughs> um, and so it's, it's a bit of, um, the US is very much a far away and less interested player in comparison with Russia and China. Hmm. Just to, maybe I could just throw another question into the, the, the panel. I, I've been very intrigued in this discussion that the expert community has been, been having about the Nazarbayev moment in this this hunt for sort of comparisons. Is he doing a Lee Kuan Yew? Is he doing a, is this a, a Chinese model? Is this learnt from the presence of certain senior officials' experience in China in the 1989, 1990? And there seems to be this, this absence. I'd like to pick up on something that, that you said, Erica, about these institutions remaining 
uh, Soviet constructs, which is to what extent can we, should we be thinking about this comparison in the Soviet context? Are we likely to have a, well, uh, do we face an, um, after Nazarbayev's, you know, if he, when he finally departs the scene sort of uh, fully, could we expect a situation like uh, a sort of triumvirate to emerge in the Soviet state, such as it did in the Soviet Union, briefly? Should we expect maybe a sequence of Chinenkos and uh, until uh, a dominant leader comes? How important will bargaining between the security forces, the party? We haven't discussed that, and some I'd be interested in your views on how real the party is compared to. Uh, Yedina Russia or to United Russia or to other attempts to party build in in the in the former Soviet uh, Union. Okay. All right. Um, so several things here. First, um, Take up whatever you want. Okay. So that's sort of, because there's <laughs> for the, a whole panel discussion there. The Soviet context. Uh, Kazakhstan is one of those uh, countries. Um, where interior ministry is the least reformed institution compared to other government agencies. And we see this happen throughout, basically throughout, with some exceptions throughout the Soviet regime, because it's just so easy, even for elected officials, officials who were elected in competitive elections, to just continue relying on political loyalty of the Soviet police. Um, and the Soviet police, Milica, was built in a way to protect the status quo from the population, in a way. Um, that's, and that's different from army. So Kazakhstan is in this predicament as well, that there was really no incentive, political incentive, to dismantle those Soviet structures and make it more open, more considerate to the needs of the society. Um, and that's in comparison to, let's say, you know, the banking system in Kazakhstan, fiscal system, maybe education, even healthcare, that have seen a lot more change, a lot more reform um, compared to um, security, um, internal security. Uh, regarding party, um, uh, one way of looking at it is it is a corporation. There is no unifying idea. There are certain patrimonial, neo patrimonial economic relations in it. So as long as those um, in monetary incentives continue to stay in place, I don't think uh, it will dismantle. It can be quite a coherent uh, redistributive uh, body within uh, Kazakh elites. Um, and um, so this is, and, and this again, this type of parties we see in other parts of the Soviet regime and around the world where you see, where you see uh, authoritarian leaders, that part, presidential parties or corporations, um, Yedina Russia in, in Russia in a way follows the same pattern as well. I'd just be interested more directly on the comparison of Yedina Russia. Like, do you mm -hmm. think that the party in Kazakhstan is more or less real than Yedina Russia? Just maybe an example that we've sort of studied yeah. a bit more closely at, at Hudson. The, the, there are actually comparisons that exist about it that, um, in a way, the no, no, I mean real in the right. sort of. But in a way, the it's an institution and not simply a redistribution for right. clearing house for officials. <laughs> yeah. So, um, from my understanding, and Merlin should know more about this, that. Um, there is a bit of a more institutionalization within um, Nuratan party compared to Yedina Rasia. There is some, again, middle, I think there is a more mid-level bureaucracy, and there are members um, that are this cluster of members of foreign educated, uh, middle-aged and younger members that are part of the, the technocrats of uh, Nuratan party. And you don't see as much in Yedina Russia, but I'll leave it for Marlene to explore. Yeah. No, I, I agree. I think one of the huge differences is that Yedina, Yedina Russia is m m much more efficient in terms of its level of sophistication in e producing voters, right? The electoral <laughs> management is going through Yedinaya Russia much more than I think it's going through Nuratan. That's because you have to produce some voters in <laughs> Russia. You don't yes. have to produce any in Kazakhstan. <laughs> but the, the kind of, you, your question about how to compare what is happening yes. in Kazakhstan with other countries, I think what would be interesting, and that would change our view of what is happening now, will be what will happen in Russia. Right? If suddenly we could imagine Russia following a kind of same model with Putin leaving the presidency but keeping the Security Council and a lot of 
um, security strategic oriented institution. And in that case, we would look at Kazakhstan as having showing <laughs> The, 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 the way which, in a sense, could have some historical legitimacy. If you look in terms of Eurasian Union, Kazakhstan yes. has been branding it before uh, uh, Russia did. So on many aspects, some element of the Central Asian political leadership has been showing the way for things that Russia has been doing after and not necessarily the other way around. If things happen differently in Russia, then the Kazakh case will remain kind of quite specific for the region, but I think each country is testing different mechanisms. We saw the Armenia Velvet Revolution also showing another way where you yes. think you can prepare a transition and you can fail at managing it. So, so each country has also its own path. It was really interesting in the comparison between Putin and Nazarbayev, I think, is also, uh, is also, fa is also fascinating and not particularly flattering to Putin, uh, sort of thinking, you know, something that's come up, come up a lot in this panel is Nazarbayev, perhaps because of his role as a Soviet bureaucrat and a party official, a role that Putin never held, Putin coming from uh, the, infamously from the, the KGB, having these long-term objectives, goals, viewing institutions differently. Something I've always been struck about from studying Putin closely is how emotional Putin can be for somebody that doesn't give very much emotion away. A lot of these decisions, such as his return, you know, his return to the presidency, his reactions in international diplomacy, just can be very emotional in a way that I haven't, apart from maybe a few eccentric politics to do, policies to do with funding life extension research, noticed <laughs> with... Uh, with um, uh, with Nazarbayev, uh, I'd like to to come back to to you to you, Nate, before sort of opening up to the floor, which is this question of the the Eurasian Eurasian Union. And for, for uh, I've often felt that this institution, which is taken very very seriously in Russia, of course, has not perhaps been. We haven't perhaps realised just how much is actually there now, compared to how it was greeted by Western uh, analysts at its launch, and it's not discussed right. perhaps as much as it, it would, it certainly is in the Kazakh press. I'd be very interested in, mm -hmm. in your assessment, how much is actually there, what are the key bits which are there, yeah. and well, I guess my second question in that would be looking, I'd be interested in your assessment on the Russian level of influence and control over these various levers in the Kazakh uh, military and security forces. Air defenses, something which is very interesting that that's mm -hmm. in the Russian ambit. I'd be very interested also in your thoughts, Erica, on the interior ministry. You know, how much of a... Ru you say it's been unreformed, but how much Russian influence is there over uh, this? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I, I, I can't touch the security ones. I simply don't know enough. But I'll, I'll, on the Eurasian Economic Union, I mean... The challenge with it, I think, is that it, it, was, it was bandied out, it was put out in 2014 and 2015 as such an enormous step. And it, it isn't that. Yes. It's fairly modest, I think, in its actual um, institutions, but it is a real institution. And it does have real consequences. It does have actual things that it performs and functions. It's, it's, it's performed in terms of harmonizing um, tariffs and some of the non-tariff regulations in the region in terms of changing especially labor uh, permissions for workers um, from the member states to work in other member states. Um, those, those have an impact. It's, it's, it's one of the really challenging things, I think, from assessing it from a, you know, I'll say a Western perspective, is that it's, it's like seven, it's sort of this, this model of like 60, 70% fulfillment. So you have these rules, you have these laws, you have these regulations, and they're, they're real, they happen, yeah. they have impact, but then there are so many breaches. And it is challenging to not, only see, to see, to not see only the breaches. Um, but the breaches are also real. So for instance, Kazakhstan has been, basically since Kyrgyzstan exceeded in 2015, has been off and on, and often very frequently, um, blocking the border 
um, to, to, to Kyrgyz trucks bringing goods in. It's an enormous problem for Kyrgyzstan. It's just this constant, one of the many things that contributes to Kyrgyzstan's like, constant morass is that they're now in this union that has caused various problems for their trade with China, um, but that they aren't fully in because they don't have the phytosanitary facilities that they were supposed to have because Russia never paid for them because Russia had an economic crisis when the Eurasian Economic Union started. And so you get hundreds of trucks backed up at the Kyrgyz-Kazakh border over and over and over again. And so it's, it, it is a thing where, you know, it's young. So was that happening five years into the customs union in Europe? Uh, maybe it was, you know, maybe it was. And, and maybe this is just growing pains. There's certainly people who argue that, you know, the Eurasian Economic Union is so young, it's just getting started, give it time. Um, I tend to think that's not really the case. I don't think it's growing pains. I think this is kind of what it is, because this is the kind of governance that happens in the region. It's very personalized. Um, Kazakhstan will block the border with Kyrgyzstan or with Russia, which they did at the height of the crisis in, in 2014, 2015, when they were having issues with people going across the border to buy goods in Russia because they were so much cheaper. Um, they'll, they'll, they'll impose all kinds of restrictions there because they can very highly personalized systems, yeah. um, heavy level of control. They can make those kinds of snap decisions and violate those laws. Um, those kinds of things, um, I think, will continue. I think it'll be more the norm um, than the exception. At the same time, yes, the Eurasian Economic Union is some kind of actual economic union. It's just in this like 60 70% fulfillment sort of thing. And I think it'll sort of stay there. Interesting. Um, well, now I'd like to. You know, we've got sort of uh, 20 minutes left, so I'd love to, to open up the questions that are shoot sprouting uh, away. Um, the, the woman at the front. Thank you so much for the presentation. I'm Rumika from JBIC. My question is about the next president. Uh, at this moment, is it safe to see Dariga, the older daughter, is going to be the next president? And if there is any like outstanding candidates, I would like to know. And also, if you can think of any events that can ruin the tight managed um, transition, I'd like to know as well. Thank you. I think we. Yeah, there's your suggestion to collect several questions. I, I don't know. Sure. And the, the gentleman at the far, at the back. Hi, good morning, Alex Sanchez, Jane Defense. My question is actually about the current president, Tokayev. I, wonder if, I was wondering, wondering if you can give a bit of a profile about him and what you expect him to do, if anything. I mean, he's going to be in power for at least a year. He's not a political lightweight. He was the undersecretary for the UN over in Geneva. So do you think he's just going to be a caretaker type of, type of president? He's going to maintain the really the status quo for one year, and then the next president, you no. Know, handled all the projects, all the problems, or do you think he's actually going to do anything either at the foreign policy level or the domestic level to address the, the issues that you talked about? Thank you. I think that, that's quite a nice sort of, let's just take those two questions and then I, I shall come back to you. Sort of, uh, yeah, I think that, that has a nice unity to it, those two. <laughs> would you like to go, Marlene, or would you do it? <laughs> okay. Um, regarding the current president, um, he is uh, young, girl, compared to, <laughs> um, compared to Nazarbayev. Um, we still need to see his management style as he, if he's able to establish himself as an, as, um, as an authority. For now, it looks like as he's <coughs> a little more, he's navigating that space. But he doesn't seem to be like pre presidential. Regarding Dariga Nazarbayev, um, I think it's hard to really predict who's going to be the president, but that Dariga Nazarbayeva will play some role, whoever is elected, if she is elected or not. Um, I think, um, so the Kazakhstan, Kazakh, Kazakh government is really good about scanning public opinion. Um, and that will be taken into consideration in uh, who, it, perhaps it's already decided, it's all speculations, but public opinion will be taken into consideration whoever is promoted into presidential uh, ranks after Tokayev. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think I think we don't know, but they don't know neither. <laughs> fact, and I think we have to trust these regimes as building step by step and kind of keeping a portfolio of actions. And then they try one, they look how people react, how the elites react, and then they adjust. 
And I think they have been good at that, and, and probably they will also try to see how things are going, so they will scan public opinion, they will see the atmosphere inside the elites, inside the state administration, they will see the perception of the family. So all these elements, they will take them into consideration, and probably they will try to play as long as they can multiple cards, so then they can always go back to another card if they feel they have, they, the one they have uh, doesn't work. And on Tokayev, yeah, we don't know a lot. Uh, at the same time, we knew nothing about Mirzoyev, almost, and we got surprised. So in a sense, many, I mean, it's not to say that he will become a kind of long-term president of, of Kazakhstan, but the, the way this political system functions, and because they lack institutionalization, but because also it's difficult to identify those who are under the president, we also don't know exactly the personality of people. And then sometimes, just occupying the function can create the president, right? Yes. So you can suddenly find yourself in the function, and well, over one, two years, you can put your own elite, change your security services, and create your own network, and suddenly appear the very strong <coughs> president. I mean, we have Mirzoyev case, we had Berdy uh, in, uh, in, um, yeah, in, in <laughs> Turkmenistan, so, yeah. so we don't know. I think we don't know. We can have a Tokayev that would just be a transition, and we could have suddenly a Tokayev more powerful than we imagine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, I agree with all of that. I think there's this sort of, uh, however to put it, like a 2B option in the phases that Marlene laid out, which is, you know, we all assume that someone else will become president, I think, because most people assume Tokayev is a caretaker in this period. But of course, Tokayev could be the permanent caretaker, right, until Nazarbayev actually leaves. So you, there could be a decision Nazarbayev, looking at this duopoly situation that's forthcoming with the elections in 2020, to say, actually, what I want to have happen is my appointee stays in power because I trust him, and, and I know what he's going to do, and we can work together. And so let's continue through that period. And then Tokayev, I think if Nazarbayev still holds the decisive vote, um, then he becomes the, 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 care, the, the caretaker in perpetuity. And then we only find out really who he is and what's going on. Uh, after uh, Nazarbayev passes away, and, and there's really only one president. Um, on Doriga, yeah, I, I, I tend to think she's probably too risky. I think a lot of her profile and a lot of the things that happened with her husband and um, <laughs> her background, you know, make her, uh, uh, you know, these people, these figures are, are, are like unfamiliar or strange to us, right, from the outside, but for people in Kazakhstan, they are not. They've been living with them for decades, and she has a certain profile, and I don't think it's that. It's super positive with a lot of people. And so I think that makes her a very risky candidate, as, as Marlene said. I mean, it doesn't count her out, of course, but makes her a, a daring candidate. So, um, The gentleman with the bid. <laughs> I'm uh, Peter Humphrey, an intel analyst and a former diplomat. Big surprise for me is that Kazakhstan has never hired uh, American firms to do a comprehensive mineral survey of the whole country. Um, to move away from the emphasis on petroleum. That's something that needs to be done. The question is, um, do you think that Putin signed off on this? In, in other words, uh, and maybe even suggested it. Like Marlene said, you know, maybe Putin will follow uh, Nazarbayev's model, but it, it could be the other way around, where Putin suggested, this is what I'm going to do, maybe you should do it first. And second of all, more importantly, um, given that the Russians are under demographic pressure, um, does this evolution in some way tempt Putin to dalliance amongst the Russian population in Kazakhstan? Uh, could we see Novo Russia pressures once again to liberate the, the Russians at this time of international stress or whatever terminology he would choose to use? to justify uh, his actions. And just uh, the gentleman, just, uh, just, just there, yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Troy Edeline. Um, I have a question specifically about if you can, uh, the timing of the decision, if you could just give more insights into that. Was it 100% a controlled decision, or is there any indication that it may have been, his hand might have been forced in some way? And it seems like there, there's, there's the 
the decision, the timing of the big decision, but then given his other roles that he's maintaining, there's there's other timing to be uh, to be, I guess, predicted. So there's anyway, just insights into the timing of the decision. I think those two questions work well together. Well, we do, of course, know that uh, Putin was called first uh, before the decision uh, was uh, announced. What we don't know is a uh, level of contacts that took place with uh, with Beijing. Yeah. Yeah, or the um, nature of that call, if there was one. I think we are just overestimating Russia's role. I mean, the Kazakhstani elite don't take their order in Moscow. I think we should really be very careful on that. They took their own decision, and then, yeah, probably you call Russia and you explain it's coming. That doesn't mean that Russia took any decision, and I don't think the Russian elites... I think the Russian elites trust the Kazakhstani elites for make it, it well in the best way they can and not trying to interfere too much because they also don't want to create a, a backlash reaction. So I, I wouldn't believe in, in kind of putting, proposing Nazarbayev to try that solution that I think that, that doesn't work. The risk of uh, Novorossiya, we didn't have it in 2014. We have less and less risk of having it. Uh, <laughs> Russia is not interested in destabilizing Kazakhstan. Russia cannot afford to destabilize uh, uh, Kazakhstan. The, ca the Russian population doesn't care about Russia in Kazakhstan and has no kind of specific views of what northern Kazakhstan can be compared to the symbolism of, of Crimea or, or the Donbass region. Russians are leaving. Russia needs ethnic Russians to go back to Russia to help for the demographic uh, 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 transformation. So on the contrary, I think this issue kind of slowly getting out of the picture. It was important in the 90s. I don't think it will be anymore now. Just to sort of maybe a little comment uh, uh, about, since we've been talking about long-term long -term trends, uh, something that I, if we were going to imagine a uh, post-Putin era in Russia, which doesn't seem a particularly useful exercise to do uh, this morning, uh, it's worth noting that the, some of the most popular policies advocated by Alexei Navalny, this sort of leading opposition figure, has been a visa regime with Central Asia. And that the idea that Russia needs stronger borders, right. that Russia shouldn't have this demographic threat of migrants from Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan in particular. So that, that I think, is, is really something very interesting going forward. And what that would do to the Eurasian Union or the labor market and the identity of these states uh, uh, going forward. So I'd like, to, I'd like to ask that before we take another round of questions is because Russia is in a, a declining demographic presence in, uh, in Kazakhstan and we're going to be entering into a situation where a political leader will need to create new sources of uh, legitimacy um, based on what the panel's been saying, do you think that the, ne the next leader uh, seeking that legitimacy could be tempted to go for a more populist, anti-Chinese moment of rhetoric? You mean in Russia or in, in Kazakhstan? In, in... So, <laughs> or is that pure speculation? No, I, I just tend to be. I tend to be boring on these things. I, I tend to think that the elite, you know, whoever comes is not going to be coming to reject Nazarbayev's legacy. I think he's done a very good, unless something really dramatic external happens in, like in the Karimov's next couple of years, case. unlike in Karimov's case, where I think, although it's been, they've been cautious, Mirzoyev has been cautious about how far he's gone on that, there's a very strong sense that really what I'm doing is undoing a lot of the damage that was done for two yeah. decades, and I'm doing it slowly, and I'm doing it in certain confines that, you know, other, you know, I'm doing it in a certain way, but it's very much targeted towards this man's legacy is not a positive for our country. I do think whoever comes in Kazakhstan for the foreseeable future, so five for 10 years or whatever, is going to be continuing his legacy and will specifically say, I am continuing his legacy. And that will include continuing the policies related to ethnic minorities and related to China. It's also a recognition of facts, I mean, frankly, is that, and I, this is also a very significant difference um, with Uzbekistan and with the transition there is that because of the way Karimov was um, and because of the kinds of policies he pursued, the extreme autarky, the extreme repression, um, there was frankly a lot of low-hanging fruit. Um, it, it, it was, it's not that it hasn't been difficult or that Mirzoev hasn't made bold choices, but there's a lot of kind of obvious things that you, 
needed one needed to do. They were desperate to do because they needed foreign direct investment, so like floating the current or uh, making the currency convertible and things like this. But also regional dynamics, you know, opening borders and allowing people to travel again, um, allowing cross-border trade to take place in Central Asia. All of that was kind of obvious. You know, Nazarbayev doesn't leave a sort of a, an, no. an obvious menu of well, these are just the things that we're going to do. It's going to be very, you know, here's the first things I do for the next three years, and I'm going to get a lot of great write-ups. And that's a credit, in some sense, to Nazarbayev. He, he did the low-hanging fruit. <laughs> um, and so it's a much, in some ways, it's a trickier case with whoever comes in, because they come in with sort of low growth or, or relatively low growth. They, they come in in a position when the economy is fairly developed along the model that it can be, and a transition to a different model is actually very hard. There have been some reforms to state institutions, not all. The ones that are left are the hardest ones, like the interior. And so, you know, he, whoever this is, is going to be, in some ways, in a trickier situation in, in that sense. But that means to me that they're going to continue, basically, this kind of piecemeal, slow, conservative change, because that's the model that Nazarbayev built. Fascinating. I guess we've got time for one more round of, of questions. So, or, or one more question. The, the gentleman uh, uh, over there. <laughs> Hi, uh, Jason Morton with the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Um, I wanted to push more on the question of timing, actually, which um, uh, a previous um, person in the audience asked. So it's true that this has been in the works for years, uh, but the specific timing, I think, did catch a lot of observers off guard. Um, and just in terms of optics, it's hard to imagine that Nazarbayev, after 30 years, uh, or almost 30 years in office would have chosen such a time of persistent protest and social frustration as the moment for this transition. Um, are we, you know, as a corollary question, are we underestimating the role of the street in potentially uh, the specific timing of this move? Mm -hmm. I would say, so I, you know, there are protests happening in Kazakhstan and there's a lot of, I think, hot debate about Xinjiang in particular. Um, but this isn't, this, this, the, the exact moment right now in 2019 actually isn't the hottest moment in the past several years, right? The land reforms um, in 2016 um, drew much, much larger uh, numbers in the streets, um, kind of the, the, the first really big numbers. And before that, you had the terrorist attacks and kind of the sense of instability that that was creating and then around the same time. Um, so I, I, certainly the timing the exact announcement was surprising. I mean, absolutely, I think people were caught off guard. But I, part of that, I think, is just because Nazarbayev has been hinting at something like this for five years, uh, three minimum. And so there's been so many false starts. I mean, literally him saying, I'm going to give a press conference uh, you know, at 8 PM, and everyone's excited and tunes in, and then he announces basically nothing, that the surprise was that he announced something. Um, but I, I, so I, I don't particularly connect it, and, and I also don't think that there would have ever been, in fact, I would say that there, has, there would never have been really a good time without any protests. And I think some of that's sort of the context in which I would place this, is that since 2014, um, with the economic crisis, with Crimea, with the issues with China and, and nationalism, there's never been a great time for Nazarbayev to step down. And, and maybe he was looking for it. Um, but if he was looking for it, I think this decision is to say it's just never going to come. There's never going to be a month or two months or six months when I can say it's all calm, now I move on. Um, because it really has been just one thing after another during this period. I actually think um, if we try to read the tea leaves, I mean, there was a preparation in the making that Tokayev mentioned last summer, I think, that Nazarbayev is not going to run for re-election. And that was the first hint, or one of the hints. Um, I think um, it is one of the calmest times in Kazakhstan in general. And uh, some of the major decisions for the future, especially uh, the alphabet, have been made. And those decisions have settled down and became uh, the new reality for Kazakhstan. And there is a sense of where the country is going, what the country is. Um, and that's sort of this. Uh, elusive uh, and yet stability that Nazarbayev has been pursuing uh, for decades. Um, of course, we don't know what's happening on, you know, personally to him as a human being. Um, so, you know, we're all mortals. We don't know that. Time will show. But I think um, so th these are some of the calculations that went into his head. And I would have had just also something on the international environment. Mm -hmm. 
mm. right? He traveled here last year. He met Trump. Mm -hmm. It's symbolically important. Trump administration not playing a big role, so no kind of big U.S. Mm -hmm. role. Putin reelected last year and not under a lot of kind of ideological ex ex excitation, but more kind of Russia going on a slower, more modest, inward looking path in just trying to manage things softly. It's also a quite, looks like a quite yeah, moment to moment. also yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. just see things kind of calming down after the 2014 and just kind of giving some <clears throat> room of maneuver for managing the transition without having a lot of international pressure or being manipulated or, or voluntarily or not by, by a lot of, of things going on around. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. I think we've run out of time, so if you could just join me in a round of applause for our <laughs> fabulous uh, panel. <laughs>